get a quick welcoming remark and then we'll get underway. Welcome everyone to our first 8P Research Roundtable. I'm so excited that um, it's been an interesting last two years with the pandemic and we're really truly kicking this off. Um, and it's the perfect timing to do so. So I wanted to thank the 8P Hero family members who are on this call, um, who share their knowledge, their insights about the patient journey and our 8P Heroes lives, um, the catalytic dollars that were needed to really launch this. Um, and of course, your inv invaluable time and energy. Um, we also have dedicated researchers, researchers on this call and team members and board members. Um, so it truly is a round table and that is the intent of this, despite looking like Hollywood squares on Zoom. Um, our mantra is together towards treatment um, and this round table will, will remain true to this mantra. So without further ado, back to Perlara. Awesome, thank you. Whitney, do you wanna just um, maybe do a quick review of our uh, community engagement policy? Sure. Thank you. Oops. I see your Slack, Whitney. Yeah, I see that. I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> Just don't open up your bank account. <laughs> Rearrange some windows real quick. Sorry about that. Okay. Are we good now? Mm, still saying started. Not yet. I can pull it up if you want. You want me to do it? I think I think I've got it now. Okay. Can you see it? Negative. Not yet. Okay, I'll let you pull it up, Bina. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay, hold on. All right, we're on the agenda. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we just wanted to start by sharing um, our community engagement policy by, by going over that real quickly. I know we sent this out to all of you um, ahead of the meeting, so we'll go over that and then we'll have some brief introductions from everyone really quickly um, and then we'll get into the um, to your research plan. So uh, this is the community engagement policy we shared with everyone. This is really just to sort of um, make sure that we're all on the same page as far as the purpose of this meeting um, and to, yeah, sense center our intention for um, what we hope to achieve here. Um, so the goal of this, pro or the research roundtable, uh, the purpose is for academic and industry researchers to share their research progress on AP disorders um, and to bring brainstorm thoughtful approaches towards uh, therapeutic discovery. So it's intended to be primarily a, a scientific meeting to um, continue to further accelerate research for therapeutic development. Um, but we believe strongly in empowering the community um, and a team-led science approach. Um, as Bina said, none of this, this science could happen without um, the 8P community. So we want you to know what's going on, to be involved, to be able to um, voice your thoughts because this, this research directly impacts you. Um, so we invite the 8P community to attend these monthly meetings um, and to be engaged in the discussion. Um, but just a few words of note that these meetings will be um, quite technical and directed towards a scientific audience. Um, the work shared in these meetings is intended to be shared um, only among the 8P community. So um, much of this work will be unpublished as it's shared. So we would just wanna be mindful um, of that. Um, given the nature of the meetings uh, and the limited time available, uh, Q&A may be responded to separately. So we've decided for future meetings, we're gonna have um, probably an hour long meeting and then an additional 30 minutes that folks are w welcome to stay on so that we can continue the discussion and, and have more Q&A about the topic. Um, and yeah, as Bina mentioned, we'll, we're gonna record these meetings and make them available for those who uh, can't attend. Um, and again, a more lay focused discussion can happen in sort of the follow on period and it, 
and in future meetings. Do you want to go into intros and then I can share the slides again, Ethan? Yeah, maybe we can just do intros uh, and then we can maybe focus on our each other's faces, at least for that. And then, yeah, we can reshare that. I, we can go back into the slide flow. So let's see. Um, I can maybe uh, kick things off here. So uh, I'm Ethan Perlstein, founder and CEO of, of Perlara. Uh, we're working uh, with Project AP as their distributed research team. And I'll get a little bit into more uh, detail about what that what that involves. Uh, but, but for now, I'll pass the mic over to my colleague, uh, Whitney. Hi everyone, I, I'm Whitney. Um, I have a background in biochemistry and I am um, leading research management uh, for Project AP, so coordinating all the, the various research activities and groups. And then maybe I'm looking, everyone knows Bina. Uh, she, she's an all-star rock star here. So no, we can, we can save uh, those 30 seconds, pass them to someone else. I see next to her on my screen, at least Faye, and then I'll just kind of go across the, uh, kind of the tiles uh, that way, snaking back and forth. Hi, I'm Faye. Um, I'm here mostly as an 8P parent, but I used to be a scientist as well. So my daughter has invert dupe delete 8P. Welcome. And uh, Glennis. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Evan Echo's lab at the University of Washington. Um, recently generated the first complete sequence of human chromosome eight and have been working with researchers around the world to generate the complete sequence of the human genome, which was announced last month. So we've been working with Bina and her family, um, yeah, to kind of sequence and assemble patients' genomes to build like kind of a reference data a database that we can uh, detect variants that cause disease and hopefully treat them in the future. Thank you. Uh, Thomas. There it is. Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Peterson. I'm actually on the board of directors for Project 8P. So just happy to be here and learn some um, insights from you guys. Thomas is also a scientist. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Next up, uh, Katie. Hi hey everyone, co-chair of Project AP's Patient Leadership Board. Um, I just posted in the chat, but for AP families, if your questions are not addressed today, please feel free to uh, add them as a comment or email me and we'll address them later. Thank you. Uh, Johnny, Yanni, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. Yeah, hi, I'm Yanni from Denmark. and um, I'm an AP mom and I also work in special education. Welcome, uh, Camilla. Yes, hello. So I'm Camilla, I'm from France, and I'm my AP parents. And I'm really happy to hear about what's happening with the research. Thank you. And Rebecca. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca. I'm in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, I'm an 8P mum to a nine-year-old with in the LHP, Hannah. Um, I'm on the PLB and I work in the rare disease space as well with Rare Revolution magazine. Arie. Hi, everyone. I'm Arie Warmplash. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biosciences at Rice um, in my lab uses human embryonic stem cell systems to study early human development. Thank you. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Sissel Smith. I am an 8P mom to an eight-year-old with inversion duplication deletion of 8P. And I am also a proud University of Washington alumni. So I love seeing the tie. And we're also just north of you in Muckleteo. Um, uh, L, the thing, I'm not sure that's it. Yep. Hi, it's uh, Laura. Um, Laura. I'm here in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I have two girls and one of whom has 8P and she's seven years of age. Um, she has a gain on her, um, I always get confused, a gain on her P arm and a deletion on her Q arm. And uh, I'm also a speech therapist. I work part-time and I have an interest in AAC and my daughter is currently trialing an eye gaze device, actually, because she's nonverbal. Um, but there's a 
science in the family. My uncle is a, uh, looking into um, myelin sheets uh, for a cure for MS. So um, I would have an interest in, in the medical side of things. Um, so I'm very keen to see what will be discussed today and excited. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Bellucci. I'm the Director of Scientific Partnerships at Rarebase, um, which is a, a startup that's focused on finding therapies for rare disease patients and um, both novel and repurposed drugs. Excellent. Uh, Marta. Hi, uh, I'm Marta Dominguez Pieto. I'm a PhD in neuroscience and I work as a postdoc in Nicoletas Monsoy Lab in Leicester in UK. Hello, and then Nicoletta. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicoletta Monsoy. I am Associate Professor in Pharmacology at the Montfort University uh, in Leicester, United Kingdom. And we have, I have recently met uh, Vina and we have joined the project to work on mitochondria and uh, nucleus communication in 8P uh, diseases. And uh, we'll work with Marta on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll introduce her. I think she's at work. She, no so um, Jennifer is a mom to a child with an inversion du del. Um, she is in France and she also um, is one of the leads for um, our 8P European Alliance, um, where we have a lot of member countries um, that are actively um, trying to really engage in a lot of the pillars that we've been talking about. So thank you to her for taking the lead for some of that work. Um, Yes, thank you. And Alice is up next. Hi, I'm also a mum to um, a little boy with Infidute Dell AP. He's four. Um, uh, neither of my kids have gone to bed yet. So um, yeah, Gabriel appeared uh, very briefly in the background and uh, I just had a sister uh, on my knee, but um, dad's taken them down the other end of the room so <laughs> I can concentrate. <laughs> Good. Heidi. Okay, if you're not able to. Oh, Hi, <laughs> um, I'm in Alaska. I'm a mom of a three-year-old with trisomy 8P, and I'm excited that these are happening and really interested in hearing what you have to say. My background is nursing, um, emergency nursing, but I'm home with my child right now doing her care full time. Welcome. And uh, Siki, I think uh, you, you introduced in the chat. You can also introduce on camera if, if you'd like to. If not, um, Hiroi. Hi, um, I'm a, an assistant professor at UCSD. Uh, my research lab focuses on genomic imbalance. So we study Down syndrome, uh, CMVs associated with intellectual disability. Uh, we utilize stem cells to generate different brain cell types and brain organoids to have a better understanding of the consequences at the cognitive and genomic level of having imbalance in genomic material. Thank I'm you. sorry that I was late. Oh, no worries, no worries. Uh, just in time for the intros. And Martha, you also did uh, something in the chat. If you would like to say something on camera, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I think maybe, Bean, if you can go back in, into the share, um, then yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. I think we have a pretty special blend here. Um, of scientists um, and, uh, and and families, which I think is kind of the the goal we're hoping for, and um, you know we're we're trying to strike a balance here in terms of accessibility, but also uh, like this is kind of like a lab meeting um, for for the for the researchers on the call. They'll know what I mean by a lab meeting, in, in the sense that this is meant to be conversational, uh, dynamic, uh, not kind of a one-way communication. It's not really a presentation. Uh, data will be sort of raw and in process. Um, and so we obviously want to 
tell complete stories when they're ready, but a lab meeting is also a place where um, you're seeing the science being created in real time. So we want to put that out there that, um, you know, to set expectations, uh, you know, this is, we want to sort of show you research in real time from the front lines, but that, you know, that comes with some cost because maybe you'll hear an update uh, on, on one occasion and then uh, a few months later, uh, it turned out that there was, uh, what, you know, what we call uh, an artifact. There, there was something in the experiment that when we looked at it again, it didn't replicate. Or when we did it experiment uh, a slightly different way, we, we ended up getting a more trivial answer. So we just want to put that out there. And uh, again, the scientists and researchers and trainees on the call, I think, will hopefully appreciate that. But for the families who don't get that, that's that's kind of the style we want to, and the culture we want to bring to this call, because we don't just want to talk at you and 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 sound as though it's all settled law. Uh, this is kind of the science as it as it's happening. So the purpose of this call was to really just get uh, on the same page. Uh, some of the technical experts that have actually already. Uh, uh, looked at this plan and, and, and in some cases provided some feedback and we're still open to incorporating feedback, um, especially on, on the technical side. And, and there will be a plan to have this uh, uh, research uh, to your research plan also simplified so that uh, for the non-technical folks in the audience, you'll be able to, to understand what, what's going on. And, and, and for this for this presentation, I, I, I want to keep things at least uh, in terms of describing the tracks at this highest level possible um, so that everybody at least understands what are the research activities that will be ongoing in this two year time horizon. Um, and then also give a chance for, for anyone to just clarify what does that mean and what about X, Y, or Z? Is that included in one of these tracks or is, or is there a track that you think is, not, is, not, is missing? Uh, because there's, there's things that we're not necessarily mentioning here, um, like uh, all of the ongoing activities and all the ongoing um, sort of uh, capacity that's been built already on the research side in terms of biosamples and registry and so forth. So, some of that may not be explicitly covered. Um, so if there's questions about that, happy to clarify. But I wanted to just at least talk about these four tracks and just make sure that definitionally um, everybody is sort of understanding what, what we're talking about here. So the first track I, is drug repurposing. Um, so hopefully everybody understands what this concept is. Uh, and we'll actually talk about multiple different types of drug repurposing activities, uh, some of which are already ongoing, some of which are sort of in a contractual phase and in a diligence phase, and hopefully will be launched by the end of Q2. Our, our goal is um, really to kind of get track one um, solidified and in motion, um, you know, over the rest of this quarter. And uh, I'll comment uh, in a separate slide in a few moments what the ongoing activities are in this area. Um, and also so what's planned uh, for, for drug repurposing. But I assume everybody is clear what I mean by drug repurposing. If not, you can raise your hand um, or if, uh, if you wanna just sort of jump in, <laughs> uh, feel free to unmute uh, if you have any questions or drop them in the chat. But otherwise I assume at this stage in the game, everyone's sort of familiar with this concept of drug repurposing. So if that's the case, um, then the second track uh, is, is a pretty big um, umbrella and we'll un unpack it more when we get to the slide, but this is what we call neurological disease modeling. Um, and you know we wanted to specify neurological disease uh, as opposed to other potential manifestations of, of, of AP and we don't wanna uh, ignore uh, other organ systems, but I think we want to take advantage of a lot of the resource infrastructure that we've already built, and that uh, skews toward neurological. Um, and I think obviously a lot of the interventions that you'd like to have uh, happen would have impacts on, on uh, in a neurological sense. So there's obviously a, a strong reason why we make that focus, but um, just wanting to clarify that we do also recognize that there's uh, other organ systems involved and that there are other things uh, happening beyond uh, neurodevelopment or beyond development as well. Uh, but um, again, any questions about what, what we mean uh, by neurological disease modeling? 
If not, then I think chromosome therapies is probably the first place where you might be scratching your head for a second. <laughs> and uh, the representative that we have so far um, that, that we're having uh, joining uh, this, uh, this AP research community, uh, uh, Professor Jason Scheltzer, he's not able to make it. I think um, his wife is expecting a child any moment now. Um, so I, he, um, he definitely has a legitimate excuse, but uh, we're, we're starting to explore this concept of chromosome therapy um, in his lab, but, but also hope to bring in other researchers and pursue other strategies underneath this, underneath this, this umbrella. And so what briefly what, what chromosome therapy means here, and again, I'll, I'll ask if you want clarification is, you know, an analogy very much to gene therapy, where we're sort of thinking of uh, curative root cause uh, uh, addressing or root cause fixing uh, approaches, uh, instead of focus on the gene scale or a particular mutation uh, in, a, in a single gene, we're taking that same mindset of a, of a curative uh, sort of root cause addressing treatment um, and applying it at the chromosome scale. So how might you fix or repair a lesioned chromosome? How might you uh, facilitate a, a trans chromosome transplant? Um, you know, uh, because these are the things you would do that would, uh, in theory, um, you know, restore the normal so-called karyotype or the normal arrangement of chromosomes in terms of the number of chromosomes uh, and their physical uh, arrangement. Um, you would think that that would be an analogy to gene therapy where you provide the missing gene. In that case, if you can repair, replace, re-engineer the 8P chromosome or, or piece of that chromosome, then uh, this could potentially be that, that root cause addressing uh, fix. Um, and that might also has implications in terms of, you know, um, do you spend time then trying to untangle all of the various, uh, you know, causative steps and this gene was involved at this moment in time. And, uh, you know, that can obviously, uh, you can get bogged down in that. Um, and it's important work, but it can also get bogged down. You can get bogged down. So a, a chromosome therapy has the potential to focus in more of an engineering sense on what the root problem is. Um, and, and, in, and in some ways trying to um, uh, 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 bypass the, the sticky problem of having to untangle all of the, the biological mechanism, which you still, and we still propose that we need to be thinking along those strategies, but, but we also wanted to, to have this separate track we call chromosome therapy. So I'll dig into that, but at this moment, are there any other uh, sort of requests for clarifications of what I mean by that? And if not, then again, I'll just describe what we mean in this fourth track as in quote, in hero study. So this is a sort of a, making a reference to uh, uh, in vivo or in vitro studies, which you might uh, hear that term tossed around if you're on the family side. So in vitro sort of being the fancy way of referring to studies in cells or studies in, um, you know, in, even if they were uh, or organoids, uh, there are still things that you do in a dish. Um, then there are in, in vivo studies and those of course could, could involve humans, but um, th those might involve animal studies, although those seem less, um, uh, frankly, useful uh, in, in, in the case of AP as a CNV. So what we mean by in hero studies is, is really looking, looking, in, looking in our heroes um, and trying to uh, understand, disentangle, um, you know, mechanism of disease. Is this gene or set of genes, are they drivers or contributors, um, um, uh, we can assess this uh, not just in models that we can create, which are going to always be imperfect, but we could test them in the actual heroes themselves. And uh, what are the various ways we can do that? And this is the track that I definitely look uh, forward to having the most feedback on because it's the track that um, so far is the least well-developed of the four uh, and is still open, I think, to also identifying um, who are the right partners in the right labs. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the research document, I sort of nominated some individuals, some of whom are on the call, and hopefully they're amenable to sort of a, a follow-up here, but would love in track four to, to get more feedback in terms of um, what specific proposals we should be pursuing. But um, maybe I'll just kind of uh, transition right into the drug repurposing track if there's no other questions, but a couple of assumptions and expectations I wanted to just run through. Um, and these were points that were sort of elaborated in the research plan and try to distill them down to a few um, sort of fortune cookie size uh, lines that are that I hope are comprehensible both and meaningful both to the experts and to, uh, I shouldn't say experts, but to the to the scientists, the, the technical, the professionally trained scientists and to the families. Um, but I think the first is this idea that 
we want to have an emphasis on aneuploidy, which is this concept of uh, when chromosome number is out of whack. Um, we want to kind of focus on that as a disease driver, uh, not to the exclusion of any one particular gene uh, that is swept up in the 8P legion and either duplicated or deleted. Um, we definitely still want to consider those drivers, and that's like the classical sense of a gene driver. But we also, I think, want to emphasize aneuploidy as the disease driver. In other words, the fact that there is an out of, that the, the chromosome balance is out of whack, or the genome is out of whack. And it happens to be AP, that's the, the issue. But even if you look at other chromosome uh, or copy number variant uh, disorders, other chromosome rearrangements, they are also aneuploidies. And they also cause a certain set of cellular uh, stress responses or, or defects uh, at, at play out in a tissue level that are kind of common. Uh, and so focusing on them, I think, um, as some people hopefully on the call will attest to, uh, is going to be a good complement to the more classical approach of just looking at the individual genes that are swept up in the lesions and trying to make a case for why one of them is sort of the smoking gun or more of the culprit than, than the next one. I think the second assumption and expectation is that um, AP heroes will be diagnosed earlier and earlier in life. I think this will be a general feature of all genetic diseases, but I think what that means is that um, even though um, for some folks, uh, it feels like maybe a focus on neurodevelopment is too late, uh, I think uh, we need to keep in mind that um, if diagnosis is happening early and earlier, that, that, that window in which to act with an intervention and make an impact on a neurodevelopmental phenotype um, will I think increasingly be in scope. Um, and at, this, at the same time, um, we have to consider that AP heroes are going to be aging into adulthood and that there will be facets of the, the condition um, beyond the neurology and the neuro neurological aspects um, that, that will be have to consider uh, in terms of anticipating what's next in terms of treatments and what about oncogenesis risk and uh, neurogeneration risk and other, other risks that uh, potentially are lurking and that will need to be uh, studied. And then I think uh, I don't want to make it sound like we're just sort of uh, going uh, all in on one particular type of chromosome therapy, um, but I do think that uh, just like in vivo gene editing uh, is, is so long, no longer sort of the frontier. Uh, the new frontier, I think, is going to be in vivo chromosome editing. And again, what does that mean for any one particular AP hero? I don't know, but I think the mindset here that we should be considering um, moonshot projects and that there are things that are now at the frontier that won't be, and that will be much more well understood, maybe faster than we think. Uh, we, need, we need to sort of allocate uh, resources and, um, and some of our brain power to that. And so hopefully you can see in our chromosome track, chromosome therapy track, what that initial uh, foray might look like. Okay, maybe we can jump into track one here. Yeah, um, and I just wanna just make do a time check with you too and just, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I know we are running up here at the top of the hour, and I, I know we have uh, only about 15 minutes scheduled with the rest of you. So what I wanted to do here is just try to quickly summarize what the activities are that are that are current um, and not really dig too much into what's planned yet. We can definitely do that offline, especially with individual uh, researchers. Uh, but I wanted to summarize the, the ongoing drug repurposing activities. So I'll kind of, you know, that the expanded version of what we're doing is that we're doing a combination of unbiased approaches, sort of rational approaches, and then I guess what you call AI-driven uh, approaches. The AI-driven approach, maybe I can just start there because that's the easiest one to describe. That's in collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Matt Might at, U at UAB, uh, where he's uh, used uh, um, this uh, AI uh, procedure uh, he's talked a lot about, uh, uh, this, uh, something called Medicanrin. Uh, and in fact, there's been a success story that uh, I think Bina is familiar with, uh, Sandra Sermon from uh, ADP uh, Kids. They, they actually got a drug repurposing recommendation from, from Medicanrin, which is basically um, uh, the uh, machines reading or software reading all the papers that have ever been published, all these technical scientific papers that have ever been published and starting to make connections between a particular gene and let's say a, a particular um, uh, molecule or medicine that uh, let's say increases the expression of that gene or decreases it and all making all these connections based on reading millions and millions of papers uh, and trying to draw these inferences. So a recommendation was made for ketamine 
for the treatment. Yes, I said ketamine as in like special K as in the, the sedative, the horse tranquilizer, or it's actually being used as a, a low dose antidepressant as well. Um, but there was a drug recommendation from Medicarin that that, uh, that, that ketamine uh, increases the expression of ADMP, which is the gene that's reduced in their disorder. Um, and it's working. Um, so I uh, don't have any, uh, you know, we're still holding our breath in terms of what that will mean for, of what this uh, AI approach could mean for AP, AP, but we actually have some preliminary data already uh, based on a query of uh, some of the top driver genes um, that work to date has suggested are, are, are likely playing a role in, in AP pathogenesis. So the AI results hopefully will have more to talk about that maybe even as soon as next month, but certainly uh, hopefully by uh, the, the early summer. In terms of the other screening approaches, uh, RareBase uh, has, has been engaged uh, to engage in a set of uh, assays focused on uh, uh, IPSC derived neurons. Um, I'm really excited to uh, get uh, some data sets that um, involve both sort of gene expression changes and, and gene expression changes that could be beneficial to uh, 8P genes. Um, and then hopefully also some electrophysiological data as well. And then there's a whole set of screens that can be done under this umbrella of uh, high content imaging uh, and, and cell painting is one way where you basically are able to uh, color a different part of the cell with a different dye or stain. And, uh, and, and in this way, you can kind of tell uh, that a cell is sick or not and whether a, a drug makes the sick cell look healthy again. Um, and you can run those kinds of assays in, a, in several different types of cells, uh, simpler cells like fibroblasts, uh, more intermediate complexity cells like these neuroprogenitor cells derived from iPSCs, and then these excitatory neurons as well. So really excited to have already uh, several projects in motion. And we're, uh, as Nicoletta mentioned, we're, we're in discussions about mitochondrial focused readout. So there's a whole uh, plethora of, of these image-based readouts that we think we can exploit um, in these cellular models um, and be able to identify potentially clinically actionable uh, molecules in a, in a time frame of uh, you know, six to 12 months. Let's go to track two, and maybe I'll just run through these tracks and then save your questions for the end. So uh, here you'll notice that I've lifted some of the figures you generated from your proposal just because they're such beautiful figures, but I think they really also summarize well where we're headed in terms of track two and, and, and under this neurological disease modeling umbrella. Um, so there's already, again, I'm trying to summarize projects that are either in motion or uh, sort of in this evaluation stage and we're hopefully to get something uh, settled and uh, a plan of action uh, to determine really quickly. But um, we've got UCSD and Allison Motri's lab. He, he's not able to attend today, but uh, his lab is growing up so-called brain organoids, um, which will have all kinds of implications for, for what we could do with such, uh, such in vivo models, which are the kind of most complicated models you could generate short of uh, a, living, a living thing. Um, and then of course we could take advantage of um, uh, partic uh, being able to differentiate uh, induced pluripotent stem cells or these iPSCs into particular kinds of neurons um, and even start to look at a non-neuronal lineage like blood cells, um, uh, or excuse me, to, to use an, another blood cell lineage to look at a, a cell type called the microglia, um, which are not, uh, not, not your neurons per se, but are so-called inflammatory cells uh, that may be playing a role in, in disease. So modeling this array of, of cell types um, and then performing a set of standard assays, uh, including measuring gene expression, uh, including sort of measuring the status of uh, genes in terms of whether they're on or off uh, and how rap and how they're physically structured in the genome. Um, and also like the actual physical location of chromosomes relative to each other in the nucleus, which can go out of whack um, surprisingly um, when uh, you have a, an imbalance of chromosomes and, and Heroy can, I think can speak more to that. Uh, and then there's also plans to, uh, with RA's lab to look at this uh, so-called very specific type of assay where you're able to, to model early events of, of development uh, um, and have stem cells sort of form uh, early sort of embryonic uh, structures. And, and there's already early uh, evidence from um, uh, pilot work that his lab has performed uh, showing um, that uh, 8P, uh, 8P cells uh, produce a, a, a different patterning uh, or, or a patterning defect. And that can be exploited uh, to test the roles of different driver genes. So we're excited that track two is, is sort of the next most built out track after track one. And the next, uh, uh, the next few weeks and, and months will be spent and solidifying these projects and getting them uh, officially off of the ground. Track three, um, this is where uh, uh, we're gonna, uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. 
So track three is the chromosome therapies track. Uh, so this would be the track that uh, Jason Schultzer could speak to directly, but um, he's not uh, present on the call uh, this time, but hopefully will be joining us. And this project will be starting uh, this summer. And it's really uh, sort of a kitchen sink approach uh, to try to restore disomy or just getting uh, the normal chromosome count back uh, uh, in AP rearranged cells. Um, and uh, Jason's lab proposes to use as a, a number of different methods uh, to try to uh, uh, arrive at uh, uh, cells that have a, a fixed uh, AP or a fixed uh, chrom fixed chromosome AP pairs. Um, so there's a CRISPR-based approach that we can get into uh, where you could target uh, the damaged chromosome specifically uh, for destruction. Um, there's an approach where you can grow cells over time, so-called serial passage, um, and look for uh, rare events where cells will uh, spontaneously uh, uh, lose the damaged chromosome and, and regain a normal uh, so-called karyotype or normal complement of chromosome pairs. Um, and there's even a, a sort of a, a, an old technique established decades ago where you could essentially mediate a cell, a chromosome transplant, um, and you can, what's called microsomediate chromosome transfer, where you could deliver back a, a so-called healthy uh, a, a, a chromosome eight, um, and then go through some other procedures to try to restore the, the normal complement of chromosomes. So this kind of work, I think preliminarily has been done in trisomy 21. Um, and so the, the hope is that the lessons there uh, can be applied uh, to, to AP. And I'll just wrap up here because I know we've got only a few minutes, about eight minutes left here. So track four is this in hero studies track. This is a track would love to get feedback and maybe this more appropriate to get this feedback offline from uh, Glennis, for example. Um, but uh, we are proposing sort of what can be done either using patient uh, or using project eight uh, or using AP hero samples um, uh, and whether that's samples like, uh, you know, uh, 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 plasma samples or blood samples where you could do a process called proteomics, which is a way to measure the levels of uh, many, many different proteins at once. Um, you know, what is the value potentially of adding that data to uh, existing um, biosample and biorepository data? Um, there's another question about, um, and you know, and Glenn has talked earlier about the beautiful work that was done, sort of characterizing um, this sort of a pioneer inversion duplication deletion, uh, uh, um, you know, trio, and including the uh, you know, uh, Bina's daughter, and was able to do fine mapping of the chromosome AP lesion itself. And the next set of questions that arise are, well, what about genetic variation or structural variation that's outside of the AP region? How does that interact with the AP lesion itself? And how is that um, making uh, the, the problem uh, in some ways more complicated and making each AP hero uh, truly N of one if there's also mutations outside of the AP region that are contributing to their particular uh, disease course. And then I think we also were considering another strategy where could we um, complement uh, the, the diagnosis of more AP heroes by trying to find um, other patients uh, who actually have a, a loss or an extra copy uh, of, a chrome, of a bit of chromosome involving a, a particular 8P gene uh, and seeing if the phenotypes uh, of those sort of maybe sister diseases or sister patients, um, you know, whether those phenotypes match up uh, with AP heroes who, whose lesion has, uh, uh, who, whose lesion includes that same AP gene. So in other words, letting nature and these sort of natural experiments uh, arise and being able to use them uh, to help solidify by a so-called genotype phenotype relationship or saying that this particular gene uh, is responsible for this particular phenotype. So I know that was a lot of it, a fire hose of information and we should have budgeted 60 minutes for that, but maybe for anyone who has any really immediate, um, let's say feedback in the sense of, I think you're missing something or something's a little off. I'd love to get that out first. And uh, if you've got positive feedback, that's wonderful as well. Uh, but maybe that can be reserved for, for offline. But yeah, anybody, any clarifications off the bat or anything that seems strikes anybody's off, maybe we could start there because I think there are uh, some of the researchers on the call here who, could, who maybe even speak more to some of the particular experiments that are proposed. I know it's hard, but I'd really like to encourage, like, it's okay if you totally disagree <laughs> with something that was said. Um, I think that's why we're all here to just really encourage a discussion, um, proving or refuting any hypotheses. I'd like to shout out, Ben. Jump out, jump in, please. 
Ethan, I'm sorry, I, I realized that you were a um, person who's uh, going to do the uh, chromosome transfer, your track three isn't here, but that's really where my questions are. So my first PhD program was actually microcell mediated trans chromosome transfer. And so obviously you do the transfer and then you need to select, right, to make sure you only want the cell population, so uh, which have, uh, you know, obtained the chromosome. So what would your selection pressure be? Because, I mean, obviously, if you're trying to create something that's going to go back into humans, you don't want to use something like Ganzyclovir, do you, you know? Yeah, so I think that was that was proposed. The thigh meeting uh, kinase sort of negative selection was proposed as sort of a proof of concept. So I think I think this project should be viewed more as can we take some of the techniques or approaches that have worked in in other CNVs or say in trisomy twenty one because that's usually a kind of a gold star here, and can we just sort of replicate those here? And I think that's a separate. I think, I think the next two year plan is the one where we try to take these preclinical proof of concept results and actually think about a therapeutic cell product or, or you know, because at that point, hopefully we'll have more clinical experience with a lot of ex vivo editing and, and sort of what that looks like in terms of durability and safety. Um, but I, I think that's sort of, this, this, is, this is not something that I think we should be rushing headlong into the clinic for. Uh, and so we want, to, we want to learn from, you know, what's happening in, in, others, in other spaces. But I see this first two years is really about, it's more of a discovery than, than it is even preclinical in some ways, just, just sort of real true proof of concept. Um, and, I, and I don't, you know, no one thinks that it shouldn't be possible to effectively create an isogenic corrected control. Um, so it's just the question of, can we, can we do it? Um, and then I think we start to think through the therapeutic implications. But, uh, but I would say that, you know, we don't want to just, you know, delay thinking about how this has real, there could have real therapeutic implications and thinking about what that means to make a, a, a real product that would go into people. But I would say this first two-year plan just doesn't, doesn't really consider that yet, because I think we just need to get because you know Jason's plan is proposing five different strategies. You know, one of the serial passages is just sort of, you know, just just sort of just serial passage without any other perturbation. Then then adding a, a, a stressor, like a checkpoint inhibitor, and seeing mm -hmm. what happens there. And then the, the negative selection. Um, and so I, I think there's it's sort of like let's try the kitchen sink. Let's see what happens, and then we can refine some of those approaches. Um, but would love to, yeah, especially since he wasn't able to join, would love to, especially if folks are interested in maybe having a, a, a separate huddle of, for, for folks really interested in the chromosome therapy track, we can dig it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, um, I'm not sure if that answered your question now, but. It did, it did. Thank you. And I loved everything, you know, so I'm, I'm interested in every single separate huddle. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Rebecca, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I'm really, really glad that there's, you know, the option for, you know, moonshoot programs and really to push the boat out here and, and, you know, help our heroes. One thing that I want to ensure that happens, so whether it's, um, you know, lab work or, you know, you get to the point where you want to start bringing things into clinic, you want to do clinical trials, you know, we, we get something that, that we think will work, that there is community engagement the entire way throughout and that we are listening to the 8P community and the parents of the 8P kids to make sure that whatever, whether that's treatment or therapy is, is being studied, is at a level of comfort with the 8P community that they're happy for their children to, to take part. Because, you know, I am aware that a lot of this is experimental and I, I'm really excited about it, but I also from work know that you know, we get a lot of these these researchers in clinical trials and they kind of get to the end of everything, go, oh, we better ask the patient community what they want. But I just want to make sure that the community, which is a really, really tight knit community who are really, really supportive, that they're heard throughout this, this process and that you regularly check back in with the wider community to make sure that they're comfortable with the, the journey that, that's happening and the direction that you're going. For sure. I mean, I think that's hopefully this call is is proof in the pudding that that's the intent. And so I just uh, want to make sure that that will continue throughout. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that is the intent to continue hold our feet to the fire if it feels like it's not happening. But I think that is that is absolutely the intent here. Um, and having been part of other research communities where I think there was more of a kind of a 
a wall put up and it was often for the, you know, it was often with seemingly good intentions. Uh, I think, yeah, just, just looking at the, who's, you know, the, the, the window face, the window of faces here. Like, I think, um, you know, you can't tell who's the scientist necessarily, but uh, I can tell. And we have a really, we have a really good balance is what I had hoped for. Um, and I think the balance will, will probably stay that way. So I think that's the ultimate way that, you know, we'll be sticking to our promise is that you'll be here uh, every time making hearing hearing what we're saying um, i think one other thing that would be really beneficial for a lot of the community we we have a, a real mix in our community we have several of us who have completely gone no different to myself Fina, faye who are head deep in the science and we get it you know we understand we can we can research we can read having something like plain language summaries to go alongside any research reports that is written in language that is easily digestible for the entire community to understand who don't necessarily have that scientific background is something that I'd really like to see included within this so that there is there is both that information is presented for both audiences the scientific audience and the families. Absolutely yes, and I think we will be we will be extra diligent to remember and to create lay versions or accessible versions of anything that's of real importance in terms of research results and progress. So, thank you, uh, Hiroi. You're up next. Hi, uh, thank you so much for all the great questions and discussions. This has been really great and and very educational. I just wanted to say what we do with the Down syndrome community, maybe that this could fit in with what Rebecca was mentioning. So what we have with the International Mosaic Down Syndrome Association is led by families and we have retreats every other year. So scientists go to these retreats and we get to present our work to the families and we have discussions with the families. This happens over two days. Uh, so we spend a lot of time with the individuals and their families just discussing what's most important to them. And we try to explain what we're trying to do. So there's this very active engagement with the community and that's how we try to shape our research. So I think, you know, the scientific community as a whole has been, you know, moving towards that direction. And, and we're hoping that we can continue to do this here as well. Thank you for that session. That's really good. Oh, actually, I, can I can I say yes, one more thing, please? Um, for the chromosomal um, therapy, have you have you considered looking at exist sort of repression of um, that extra chromosomal region? Um, because in the Down syndrome field, there's a few people who've been actively working on this as a therapeutic avenue, right? If you can't get to remove the whole chromosome, another clever way is to try to silence that extra chromosome. Material. So I was actually looking for the, a, a right, the right lab to sort of work with on an excess project. So if you can actually recommend somebody, um, yeah. that would be wonderful. Yeah, so Jeannie Lawrence at UMass Wooster and Stefan Pinter at University of Connecticut, I would say are the two most active and Stefan being, you know, a younger professor who's now actively engaged in trying to utilize exist for all aneuploidies, not just Down syndrome. So I think these would be the two leaders. And then of course, Jeannie Lee at Harvard would be one of the great experts in exist biology. So, but I'd be happy to share some more people. No, this Thank is you. this is exactly what we're looking for in terms of, yeah, I like the way you're, you know, cause maybe, you know, maybe the, the exist biology expert is you know we're not necessarily looking to the research there but we definitely want that person to sort of maybe weigh in on proposals but then maybe the 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 professor you know to put it more bluntly that he's you know younger and hungry <laughs> uh you know is obviously i think a good you know the line there's a good alignment of incentives for that kind of a researcher i think as you understand Ari, you understand and sort of and a, and a foundation right that is um so i think that it can be those can be really special collaborations um, I know we've run over time here, but uh, anyone else who would like to either make a comment or a question, again, this will be shared uh, as, a, as a, the video link can be shared for, for reviewing and for anyone who was not present and will figure out a way to collect questions async as well. Um, maybe just to think about next steps, 
Uh, thanks, Bina, for the prompt here. So I think uh, we are just making clear that uh, the fourth Monday of next month is actually uh, is the 23rd. We're, uh, we're not going to do the last Monday, which would have technically been Memorial Day. So just be aware of that. And so the, the update, the up, I think an updated invite will be going out uh, today. And so, yeah, we would hopefully like to have the following structure um, and feel free again to weigh in um, either now or, or, or offline. But we can start with some high level updates because Pilar is acting as, as the Project AP research team. We can try to give you the most salient updates from the last time we spoke in terms of uh, research or just new projects launching or so forth. Um, then I think we want to have a research presentation from one of our uh, community members um, and uh, we're hopefully looking to line up a rare base uh, as sort of our uh, one of our first speakers since it's a project that's already uh, initially funded and in motion. And hopefully, you, you know, I know the data package is not complete yet for the AP side. Uh, there'll be some updates there about exactly what, uh, uh, what, what has been going on. So look forward, hopefully, to locking that that date down, uh, and then we would have a, a, a brief Q and A, um, and then I think yeah, if this actually expands to a sixty minute meeting, then we'll have a little bit more time uh, to do everything, uh, and then we still would love to have an overflow session. So even after the initial sixty minutes, um, you know, I, I and, and and Whitney we uh, uh, can hang back for for some or part of that extra time as well, uh, especially if it's something where there's a great conversation going and we don't want to end it immediately. So we definitely want to we want to be respectful of everyone time, but we want to make, as Project AP's research team, we want to also make ourselves available since these are once a month, um, and especially yeah, if we get really good uh, creative juices flowing, uh, we want to uh, have that have the ability to have some flexible time. So um, unless there's anybody who has any immediate feedback on that, I think I will um, maybe uh, let Bina uh, you know, have a final word here, unless there's anyone else who has any feedback they'd like to share right now. I think this is sort of everything I expected in terms of a great attendance and great balance of, of researchers and families and great questions about um, and you know tells me where, where where people are thinking about this and and uh, that this is going to turn into a really great platform uh, for for moving the research forward and for having the whole community be accountable to itself. So um, thank you all for participating and yeah, unless there's any other final words, Bina. Sharon, did any of y'all want to say anything? No, okay. Well, I just, I mean, as you all know, we're so grateful. Um, it's certainly um, a very ultra rare disease. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we were not even, you know, an organization. So um, I'm just really grateful. I'm very impatient. Um, and every day I'm reminded um, by my beautiful daughter of the urgent medical need here. And so we're just, you know, balancing all of that and doing as much as we can. So Again, the mantra together towards treatment, I think we really are trying to trailblaze and keep so true to that. Um, every month in between, I mean, Project AP is patient-led and patient-centered and um, the Parallel team is working with us. So, you know, at the end of the day, every day, um, the community is at top of mind and the patient voice and we'll be sharing our chromosome AP registry insights the more that we develop that and our biorepository is growing and you know, we've been talking to a lot of the scientists on the call about just having a more robust biobank that's linked to all of the symptoms and the things that we're seeing in our AP heroes um, in a really systematic, standardized way, consistent protocols at the bench. Um, and, and so we need all of your help. Um, and, and thank you so much for just even being on this call. Um, I know it's hard. I mean, my daughter's like, screaming, not going to the bathroom right now so I can hear her. And, and that happens to all of us. So again, just really grateful. If any suggestions, like Whitney at perlara.com is the email right now. And Whitney is so on top of everything, um, just in a few months of getting to know us and working with us. And so thanks, Whitney. Thank you so much, Ethan, and um, the greater Perlara team as well for just, um, I mean, it's you guys are really catalyzing all of this. It's all the names and all the scientists that we've been talking to for years and just putting it all together in such an organized way. And it's like green light, let's go. Um, I used to race cars and I can't go fast enough. So thanks so much. <laughs> Not reckless driving, okay? <laughs> no, no, this is all, yeah, buckle up, but yeah, go fast. 
Thank, thanks, everybody, then. Uh, and uh, we will be sharing the link to this. Uh, and then stay tuned again for the invite for the May 23rd roundtable. And we'll get commitment uh, in terms of our next speaker. And we'll have the agenda sent out in advance as, and as, well, as well. So thanks, everybody, uh, for your attendance and researcher and families all. Thank you so much for all you do for, for the AP Heroes. And yeah, we're just getting started here. So onward. <laughs>